Welcome back to another Jumpstart Devlog. I'm Chaz, and I'm working on a casual roguelike for Android. Following after the previous Devlog, I knew I wanted to make each area of the game feel visually distinct to each other. I decided to use that palette swapping from the end of last week's Devlog to make each level have a unique color palette. After making the palette swapper, I started work on making four unique level tile sets. The forest, desert, Tundra, and City Zones. Each tile set have the following requirements. A wall tile, a 45 degree wall tile, three inner tiles, for example, trees, crates, or buildings, a fence tile, and two decoration tiles. Once I made these tile sets, I adjusted the maze algorithm to make better looking levels. For example, fences can only be placed horizontally and there needs to be at least two of them. Another rule I added was to draw road lines wherever the car spawns. Now the player can easily find the location of the car no matter how big the level gets. They just have to find the road. With these new rules, the level looks more organic and handcrafted rather than being randomly placed with noise. On the code side, I implemented these unique attributes by making a scriptable object to represent the aspects of a level. I call this the level data file. It holds information like color palettes, tile set, name, and the types of enemies that can appear. I can also change the weight of the enemy randomizer per level. So as the days increase, you're more likely to fight harder enemies. At this point, I realized I needed to make the game look better. With the simple design of the pixel art, there needs to be more satisfying effects to make these biomes stand out. Since the game is using a pixel perfect filter, I can get away with using Unity's particle system and know that it will still look good. With that, I made a bunch of environmental particle effects for each zone. In the forest, there are leaves that gently fall down. The desert has a swarm of flies. The tundra has snowflakes. And finally, the city has rain. Since the size of these levels are dynamic, I had to make it so the particle system will change its size, max particles, and the rate over time to fit these level sizes. The last thing I did was to make a particle gunshot and knife effect. In general, I'm trying to make sure to put a pass on the juice of the game, since it's really difficult to make a 1-bit style game attractive and fun to play. I felt that the GUI was cramping my hand and didn't easily convey information to the player to make decisions. I did some research by playing other 1-bit games, and I really like how Downwell had extremely thick and large GUI. It is very easy to see how much ammo the player has with a lot of juice. I came up with a concept to push that survival horror vibe by making a heartbeat graph sensor like Resident Evil. Then I added a tiny health pack sprite and some boxes to illustrate the player's current and maximum health. Using the same code, I made the ammo GUI right below the health bar but I felt it needed some more flair to make it stand out like the heartbeat. I bought a 1-bit asset pack from itch.io and decided to use that as backdrop for the ammo. Once I make more weapons or classes, I can simply swap out the equipped weapon sprite behind the GUI. Then I added lots of tweening to make the GUI extra juicy. Even if the player does not notice these effects, it's always important to add as much juice as you can. It's one of those subtle effects that'll make the player enjoy the game more, but they won't know why. I felt it might be more interesting to have a high resolution character portrait to show what the player actually looks like. To do this, I started with a large portrait in 32 by 32 resolution of a gas mask. If there are details I can't communicate on the player themselves, I can just add that into the character portrait. The next change I made to the GUI was the touch control pad. I felt the current design caused lots of hand cramps and forced the player to use two hands. Since the game was so simple to control, I felt that it should be able to work with one hand to play. To accomplish this, I moved the shoot button to the middle of the d-pad, and I made the d-pad significantly larger. Players can now start with their thumb on the middle of the d-pad, then move it outward in the direction they want to shoot. However, the new design hides those FPS animations I made in the previous devlog. 
but I prefer comfort over style if I had to make choices. The next area of feedback I worked on was text damage. Using object pulling, I created these prefabs which spawn whenever an actor takes damage. I felt I needed to add this since the players were often confused about how much damage they were dealing to enemies. When I first implemented this feature, I noticed that enemies were attacking at the same time, making it confusing on how much damage the player was taking. To fix this, anytime an enemy attacks a player, they will wait a few seconds before they tell the game master that their turn is over. Now the player can continue to move freely, but if they're ever attacked, combat will slow down. It's like all the enemies are taking their turns smacking you to death. Since this game is going to be free, I wanted to learn how to implement ads. Luckily it was very easy to implement if you use the default Unity Ads package. All you have to do is implement the type of ad you want, like reward, interstitial, and banner, and then you add your own code when the ad is finished. In my case, I'm only using rewarded ads since I hate games that have too many. This ad will revive the player once, but my intention behind this is that it will give you a different ending. That way, you have an incentive to not watch the ad if you want to get the best ending. Unity has worked on a new ad system called Mediation, but I found it to be too confusing to set up, even though it has the potential to earn more money and has better analytics. My problem was that it only works with very specific builds of Unity, and I really want to avoid changing versions of projects. My main focus is making the game first. Since I have new levels to work with, I got to work on making new enemies. In order for this to function, I had to refactor the object pooling to support dynamic enemy types. I'd initially hard-coded the number of enemies, but since each level will have different types and quantity, I needed these pools to be dynamic. At the start of each week, the object pools will fill with the desired enemy type prefabs from the level data file. Then when the day starts, we pull from that pool of enemies anytime we need one. At the end of each week, the enemy pools will be cleared for the next one. So yeah, I'm using Instantiate again. With the foundation restructured, I can now start making enemy prefabs. I started off simple by making bug enemies. These enemies will die in one hit and are supposed to be an introductory enemy. Since each zone has unique enemy types, I made four new bugs for each area. A spider for the forest, a scorpion for the desert, a centipede for the tundra, and finally a roach for the city. I also worked on some new enemy concepts that will have different behaviors from your standard chase the player behavior. For example, I call this enemy the bloater. I want it to explode when it dies, so the player will be punished for relying on the knife. I also drew some new concepts for a bat enemy, a skeleton, and a demon enemy. Each zone in the game should have a special infected that the player needs to worry about. One task I've been avoiding was saving and loading the game. It was something I never worked on before, and I knew I had to tackle it for this project. I started by looking at some YouTube tutorials and seeing different methods of implementation. Most of the tutorials were good, but would put a significant dent into my development timeline for me to code by myself. I took a look at the Unity Asset Store for something I could use quickly, and luckily I forgot that I bought an asset on sale called Easy Save 3 by MoodKey, or MoodKai, I don't know. This asset makes it very easy to save your game in addition to file encryption. The only issue I found with it is that it doesn't work with Bluestacks, which is a common Android emulator. I decided to follow through with using this asset anyway because I felt supporting Bluestacks was out of the scope for me. I'd rather focus my time on getting this task done. I began by writing down all aspects of the game that needed to be saved. Unfortunately for me, the fact that this game is procedurally generated and turn-based meant I needed to save a lot of information. Here's a complete list of everything that needed to be saved. The game master, the run statistics, all the actors in the scene, the layout of the level, and item placement. Easy save is exactly what they say. It's easy. You simply call es3.save, then you put the variable in the file that you want to save it to. Since I use inheritance, it was very obvious where I should implement saving and loading. I made an interface called iSaveable, then implemented that interface on all of my objects, from the maze generator to the actors, enemies, and players. All I needed to do was implement this function on the base class, and then if I ever needed to, I could override it and implement anything else I want to save. Then I made the game save every time an actor takes a turn. 
This way, it was always up to date and accurate, but I quickly found out that the file IO operations are extremely laggy if you run it every time an action is taken. My first method of optimization was to separate the saving into dynamic and static saving. Static objects are anything that only changes once per day or once per week. This includes the game master and the level that's randomly generated. Dynamic objects are objects that save when their state changes, like enemies, players, and items. To further separate the work, I also save the dynamic objects to different files. Items are saved to the item.state file, the enemy and the player are saved to the actor.state, and so on. Then at the start of each day, I save everything in the game. After that, I only have to save the dynamic state of the game when events occur. An event that should trigger a save includes opening an item box, using an item, or when any actor takes damage. After all these optimizations, the game started running like it had before I implemented saving. Another method that some mobile games use is to save during application.quit. I initially did saving this way, but it can very easily lead to lost or corrupted save files since it can be inconsistent or volatile. For example, a dead battery could ruin your run, so I didn't want to rely on inconsistent events to save your game. Finally, I had to load the game. For loading, it was all about rebuilding the game from the files. For my game, I just load the previous state and steps like I'm building blocks. First I load the stats like playtime, current day, current week, etc. Then I rebuild the maze from the maze file, which is just a 2D array. After that, I populate the scene with the previous items that were in the map. And then once the items are loaded in, then we load the enemies with their previous health and position. And lastly, we load the player using their position, health, and their current upgrades. Once the loading is finished, we play a transition and we resume where the player left off. We're two and a half months in and we're nearing my deadline. I decided to push my release date to the end of November. I wanted to release it by Halloween, but I felt the game didn't have enough content or juice in its current state. Now that the foundation is built, I can focus on adding content to the game like more enemies, upgrades, and music. Ideally, I would like to be pencils down by mid-November and work on publishing the game to the Play Store. Thanks for watching and keep making games.